So here with her talk on the life-saving power of organ donation, please give a huge round of applause to Joanne Dobson. to my assistant. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's very, very scary to be here today because usually my talk takes about 40 minutes, so uh, if you may indulge me, I'm going to just go through it as soon as I can. Um, my previous role, May has left the, the building, but she, she knew me from a previous role. I was one of those MLAs when MLAs went to Stormont and actually did something. Um, and um, it, was a, it was a strange period of my life, very, very rewarding in many ways. But suppose now, I never thought I'd be an MLA, but now two things have changed dramatically in my life. Number one, I never thought I'd be a living donor, that I would be able to give one of my kidneys to my son, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. And also, I get to do my passion. There's been a lot of talk today about passion and doing something you believe in. I get to share my passion with people every day. I get to help and support people and be their voice, almost be their comfort blanket and their rock every single day. And it's brilliant when you have a, such a fulfilling job that you like to do. This is the reason I'm standing before you here today, and I was uh, um, listening to Michael's speech, he um, was talking about the IFA. My son Mark is probably the biggest Northern Ireland football fan that there is. He was a fan of the month last October, and he's just been an avid fan in his life. Pretty unremarkable young man, just like anybody in the audience here, here today, just run of the mill, just getting on with life. But Mark probably has been through more in his short life than I feel anybody, any child, any person should have to deal with. And he inspires me. He inspires me every day with how he copes and how he has coped with his life. So if you may indulge me, I want to take you on our journey. Our journey with organ donation began when Mark was born, back in, way, way back in 1993. Mark was our second son. We had an older son, Elliot. And I think you follow your mother's instincts straight from the start. And my husband and myself knew things were quite different with Mark than they had been with Elliot. He was sleeping all the time. And when he wasn't sleeping, he was being very, very sick. Persistence, I persisted and persisted. And finally, they did a simple urine test when he was five weeks old. And that test revealed, followed by scans, he was whisked by ambulance to the Royal Belfast Hospital for sick children. That test revealed that his left kidney was gone completely, it had died. And his right kidney was down to 19% kidney function. 19% five-week-old baby, toddler, and a workaholic farmer husband. I didn't choose, we didn't choose to follow this path in organ donation. I feel it chose us. Mark's childhood, our family life, centred around the Royal Belfast Hospital for Sick Children. It became our life because Mark was biopsy after biopsy, operation after operation, to try and give him as long as possible before he needed that vital kidney transplant. And I remember when Mark was 13, our wonderful um, doctor, Dr. Mary O'Connor, called John and I in, sat us down, and just said three little words. Go make memories. And that conversation gives me goosebumps to this day because we all have dreams and aspirations and things that we plan to do in a year or two time or in the future but we didn't know as a family how long we would have our mark and everything you wanted to do those holidays that you dreamed of we had to condense them into a few short months because we didn't know would mark and for die how long we would have our son and that's exactly what we did when Mark turned 15, he went on the live organ donor list, which meant he needed that vital kidney transplant to keep him alive. Now, I know most of you here today have your phones, and the phone, a bit like myself, never leaves your side. But when you're a kidney patient, your phone is your lifeline. If you're waiting on that vital call, the first piece of information I give you is never, ever, ever switch that phone off because you don't know when that call will come. 
You don't know if that call will come. And for so many people across Northern Ireland, sentenced to life and dialysis, are dying of kidney failure, that call doesn't come. But that call did come for my mark. One snowy night back in 2009, we got the call. We got the call that was to change our lives. And we were sad, we were on the cusp of new life with Mark, but also sad that someone, somewhere, was going through unimaginable grief. But through that grief, they had chosen to give not only my Mark life, but to give up to seven other people the gift of life. And that's, for that we are eternally grateful. I think kidney patients and, and my work with the volunteer we live every day to honour that gift. People say to me, well that was Mark sort of done and dust to get on with life. He had his transplant normality. But you do not know how long that gift will last. And we knew from an early age when Mark was in the children's hospital that he, he would need one, two or three transplants within his life. And I do remember Mary O'Connor saying, Mark, you need to always, always keep in with your mum because she has money in the bank to you and someday you'll have to cash her in. Mark got eight years and six months out of that precious gift. Eight years and six months of normality. He was able to finish Newbridge College in Brooklyn. He was able to go to Greenmount to learn how to be a proper farmer. He was, lear- he was able to learn to drive. All the things that you take for granted, Mark was able to do. But as I said, once you're a kidney patient, you never, ever, ever take anything for granted. January 2017, I suppose, was a, a changing point in my life because I was about to go through another election. And during routine tests in Daisy Hill Hospital in Uri, our wonderful, wonderful doctor, Neil Morgan, um, told us the news that Mark's transplanted kidney was coming to an end, it was shutting down. And to protect him from having further transplants, they made the decision to remove the kidney because as it was failing, it was producing antibodies which would affect his future. And I will never, ever, ever forget Mark coming back from surgery. Now some of you will recognise this magnificent building. This is Belfast City Hospital. And right on the 11th floor, we call it the 11th floor of hope. That's the real floor. And that's where miracles happen every single day. Mark came back from theatre, transplanted kidney removed with his wonderful, wonderful nurse Orla, but they weren't alone. Behind them was a very, very large cumbersome dialysis machine, and I watched there and then my child, because while they're 25 or 5 weeks, they're always your child, fresh hemodialysis necklines in being uh, connected up to this machine that he needed now to keep him alive blood taken out from his body, purified and put back in because now he had zero kidney function. And I said to Orla, that wonderful nurse, then please, please, please test me because I knew through my work for volunteering for all those years for kidney patients that Northern Ireland is the best place, the best place to be for live transplants. We're world beating, we're the top in Europe and I think we're number two in the world. That expertise that we have here in our wee country that isn't shouted about enough, and that's why I'm shouting about it today, puts us in the world stage. But we've had to be, we've had to be experts in living donation because so few people come forward to be a deceased donor. And that's exactly what happened with my test. I want to fast forward a bit. Our transplant took, took place back in March last year the most rewarding thing I have ever done. Now, now I'm someone who doesn't even like the dentist. I had to get into break into stress going to the dentist. Giving a kidney to my son, no problem. So, so rewarding, inspirational. And that bond that we have is stronger now than ever. Just imagine if you're able to give life to someone for a second time, and that's what I was able to do. And that was the most rewarding experience ever. While I was being worked up for my test to be a living donor, Mark had to cope with dialysis in the Daisy Hill Hospital in Uri. When I say cope, the staff were magnificent, the team were magnificent, but it is in essence a life sentence, it's like a prison sentence. Three days a week, four hours at a time, every single day, this was Christmas Eve um, that year, um, Mark 
had to be hooked up to that machine because without it he would have been he would have been kept alive. This lovely gentleman is still waiting, and for so many across Northern Ireland, the wait goes on and on and on, and many die waiting. Mark and I were honoured to take part in a programme which featured earlier this year, and I'm told it's going to be used as an education tool in schools, so you might have to listen to me again. Um, produced and written by this wonderful gentleman, BBC Sports presenter Stephen Watson, himself a kidney patient waiting on another transplant. He wrote and produced it, and that's Mark and I with our superhero surgeon, Tim Brown. So it was an honour to take part to show what it's like to be a living donor. They don't suddenly decide if you want to be a living donor, that's okay, go ahead and do it. You have to have, I suppose in essence, a full body MOT, because you're taking someone that's very, very well, and you're in essence putting them through major, major surgery. So that was the timeline of my donation before our super surgeon Tim Brown, who performed both our surgery, gave us the date and the transplant began. Probably because of my previous role as an MLA, there was quite a lot of media interest around our transplants. And I believe you should harness the media for good. Let's put out a positive story out there. And we did that. We did the interviews. We did thinking if anyone could read, read this and decide they too can be a living donor or they can tell their loved ones their wishes, how they can help someone to live after they've gone. And that's just what we used at Media for Good. These are just some personal family photographs um, on the day, the D day of the surgery. Mark and I were admitted the night before, me to the female ward in that 11th floor of Hope, and um, him to the male ward. Um, Come down to theatre, this is him getting the thumbs up because his dad has just told him my kidney has been successfully removed and it's all systems go. Not so sparky that a few hours later when he's just back from theatre and I got the nurse to walk me round from the female ward to the ward to see Mark back from theatre. And I said again, I said to him something that I'll never forget that moment, seeing my son life returning again. And I said, we did it. We made it happen. And those are memories that will live with me forever. You can already see the difference the next day. He's, he's back to normal, he's chatting. And this is him with the very fetching surgical socks uh, that they give you. My mark is not unique. We're in no way unique as a family. We have tons of marks. We have Kellyanne's, Amy's, people right across Northern Ireland. For them, sentenced to life and dialysis, waiting on that call. As a charity, and I, uh, I don't wear this just for, for no reason, we, we, the charity, we support patients every single day, whatever they need, where the financial support, emotional support, and our advocacy officer himself, one of the longest waiting patients in Northern Ireland, waited 17 years on his precious gift. One of the most rewarding things I get to do is to send these magnificent kids every single year to the transplant games to compete and to win medals. Of these kids from right across Northern Ireland, some of those children have had two or three transplants already, and we support them to do that. Next week is Organ Donation Week, so please, 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 if you can do anything, think about organ donation. If you want to get involved, this was me doing the Belfast Marathon last year, four weeks after giving my kidney. I normally couldn't walk the length of myself, but I wouldn't ask anyone to do anything I wouldn't do myself. So this is me taking part. If you want to sail, upsail down Europa or become involved, please, please, please. Michael and other speakers spoke about volunteering. It is very rewarding. I have been a volunteer since Mark was five weeks old. I have done all the things that, from coffee mornings to lock the lock to, to everything that can be done. Once a kidney patient, always a kidney patient. This is the drugs that Mark was sent home from from hospital, which he will have to take twice a day for life. Because even though he has my kidney, he still needs to take them. So that for a kidney patient sometimes is very, very difficult because their normal life is marred by drug taking. Have that conversation. If I can leave you with one thing today, please, please, please have that conversation. If you think you can help someone to live after you've gone. We're the most generous country in the world, Northern Ireland, but if you don't know the wishes of your loved one, organ donation does not take place. So tell your loved ones tonight, tell them next week in organ donation week, 
that you want to help someone to live after you've gone because everyone has it within them to be a lifesaver. Thank you. And it's obviously a very personal story and it doesn't feel like we're turning the corner in terms of organ donation and people realise and appreciating how important it is. Numbers are constantly on the rise. They are and it's events such like this so thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. Get people to think about it because sometimes it's the X factor people don't want to think about it and not happen to them. Those young people, those young people that are currently in dialysis. Any, anyone can need, you have more chance of needing an organ than giving one, so it encourages the conversation and it's great to see that more people are being uh, interested in it. These personal stories I think really matter because I know in my own life, my, my wife and I have talked about organ donation for years and she had always said no, under no circumstances she didn't want to donate anything because she's honestly, she's a truly horrible person. But, um, <laughs> you should see the size of her dad's farm, I'm going to get that with you guys. Um, so, but then we had a little one that was unwell and he needed a huge amount of surgery, a huge amount, a huge amount of blood transfusion and then for us and for her and frankly for our entire family everything changed and we realised that the generosity of whether it's living donors or donors who have sadly gone through some tragedy themselves, yeah. it's just so difficult to articulate about the difference it makes. Yeah, no we think it's coming to their door David, I didn't think it would ever come to my door but the difference it makes, I had a young gentleman a few weeks ago and um, he took a nosebleed and an organ failure happened because the nosebleed wouldn't stop bleeding. His dad's about to give him a kidney in a few weeks. You know, it can come to anyone's door and have that conversation because you're more likely to need that vital transplant and it makes such a difference. Such a difference. John, we're delighted to have you. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Uh, really great contribution.